The word allocate literally means to split up and distribute parts of a limited resource. Governments, for example, have a tax budget that they split up and allocate to different things like healthcare and education. And in exactly the same way, your computer has a limited amount of memory that can be allocated to different programs or applications. And when it comes to government spending, it's not like there's one person who decides how every single dollar should be spent. At the top level, governments have someone like a treasurer who decides in very broad general terms how the budget should be divided up. They might, for example, allocate 10% of the total budget to defense, 30% to healthcare, and 20% to education. But just like the treasurer, the person in charge of education doesn't spend every dollar that they've been given on their own. There are many more layers of people who allocate progressively smaller and more specific budgets until we get all the way down to a teacher buying office supplies or resources for their students. If you wanted, you could refer to each one of these people in this hierarchy as an allocator. Because in simple terms, all an allocator does is take a resource that's been given to them, split it up, and then allocate it further. This is exactly how memory allocation works on a computer. The operating system is just like the treasurer sitting right at the top of the hierarchy, allocating memory in bulk for programs to use. Then inside programs themselves, there are often several more layers of allocators that are choosing how to further divide up the memory that's been allocated to the program. Now that's all well and good, but so far we've only talked about giving out resources, which is called allocation. What about deallocation, which is taking those resources back again? In our government budget example, if we cancel or deallocate two budget items that both cost $10,000, we now have a combined total of $20,000 to spend on something else. And that's because an allocation of money only has one property, which is the quantity or how much money it is. It doesn't matter where the money came from or what it was previously allocated to, $20,000 is $20,000 in budgetary terms. An allocation of computer memory, on the other hand, has two properties. It does have a quantity or a size, like 50 kilobytes or one gigabyte, but an allocation of memory also has a position, otherwise known as an address. The same quantity of memory can be allocated in different places. And it might not seem so obvious on the surface, but that second property, the fact that memory has an address, means that deallocating memory is much more complicated than deallocating money. And to illustrate what I mean, imagine we're trying to write an allocator for an operating system at the top level to hand out those bulk pieces of memory to applications. So a program starts up and it makes a request for two gigabytes of memory. Now, if we want to fulfill that request, we'll need some kind of allocator to divide up two gigabytes of memory and allocate it to the application. Let's start with the simplest possible allocator. It's called a linear allocator. And to build one, you only need one single number variable, which is the address in memory of where the next allocation is going to go. So from a blank slate, if our first program is requesting two gigs of memory, the next address starts off at zero. So we allocate two gigabytes of memory at address zero, and then increment the next address by the size of the allocation. So in this case, the next address moves up from zero to two gigabytes. Then we have a second program start up and request five gigabytes. So the next address moves up to seven. Now, if our second program exits, we can reclaim that memory and reuse it by subtracting instead of adding to the next address. So we subtract the five gigabytes that the second program was using, and now we're back at two. Great. But what happens if our first program exits first? We can't rewind the next address to zero, because then as soon as we allocate more than two gigabytes, we'd end up overwriting the memory we allocated to our second program. So even though our first program has exited, we need to leave the next address at seven. So if a third program now requests two gigabytes, it's gonna be allocated at the end at seven, even though it could have fit in at zero. You can see where this is going. If any program exits other than the most recently started one, we end up with a hole in memory that we can't use. And the technical term for this type of phenomenon is fragmentation. On top of that, if we continue allocating like this, we're likely to just run out of memory completely at some point. Luckily, a linear allocator is not the only allocator in town. Over the decades, programmers have thought of a whole range of different types of allocators.
In simplified terms, the way that a modern OS allocates memory to programs is by dividing up memory into lots and lots of small blocks. Then when a process asks for 2 gigabytes or for 5 gigabytes, instead of handing the process a single unbroken block, the OS hands over a number of smaller blocks that add up to the amount requested. Then when the process exits and the memory is deallocated, the OS marks all the blocks that were owned by that process as free. Then when a new process starts up and asks for memory, the OS reallocates those free blocks from the list, allowing memory to be reused. And you've probably already figured this out, but by dividing memory into small pieces, it means that the memory handed over to applications doesn't need to be all together in one place. If I have two gigabytes of free blocks at the beginning, and three gigabytes of free blocks at the end, if a process starts up and requests five gigs, the OS can make up that number from two at the beginning and three at the end. We refer to memory that is all together with sequentially increasing addresses as contiguous. So we can say that memory allocated by the OS is not guaranteed to be contiguous. There are of course some complexity and performance trade-offs that come with non-contiguous memory, but they're considered to be well worthwhile in order to prevent fragmentation and memory exhaustion. Now it probably sounds like I'm saying that linear allocators are just bad, but that is not true at all. In fact, linear allocators are by far the simplest and fastest allocators for certain situations. As I mentioned before, with a linear allocator, you can only reclaim memory at the end of your allocations. But of course that's perfectly fine if your data structure or algorithm is guaranteed to only add or remove things from the very end of your memory. And if you know a little bit about data structures, you'll know that what I'm referring to is called a stack. And because of just how fundamental stack data structures are, if you're a programmer, a linear allocator is probably the one that you're using by far the most in your programs. Whenever you call a function, your program needs memory to store data that the function uses. You've got the arguments that get passed to the function, any local variables declared inside the function, and the return address of where the function's supposed to go back to when it's finished. These all need to be stored somewhere in memory. The chunk of memory that gets allocated to hold all of the data that a function uses is called a stack frame, and it's allocated using a linear allocator, which means that every new function call just sticks its stack frame onto the end of the previous one. And the reason that we can use a linear allocator to put stack frames into is because of a natural property of the way that functions work. Let me show you. If I have a main function as the very first entry point into my program, when the main function gets called, it's gonna put the first stack frame into my linear allocator and increment that offset for the next allocation, just like the example we worked through before. Now, if I call another function called draw graphics from inside my main function, the draw graphics function is going to push its own stack frame onto the end of the linear allocator. And you can naturally see here, because of the way that the code in the main function is always going to execute in order from top to bottom, the draw graphics function is always going to return and be deallocated before the main function does, which allows us to wind back the end of our linear allocator. If we call the second function, then it's free to override the memory that was allocated to draw graphics because we know that we're going to be finished with that function by the time the next function gets called. And then of course, in the same way as the draw graphics function, the autosave function also has to return before our main function ends, allowing us to safely wind back our linear allocator. There's a fundamental rule here, which is that whenever a function returns, it's guaranteed to be the very last stack frame in that linear allocator. So we can always wind back the next address, reclaim that memory and not get any fragmentation. To look at this another way, we can visualize our function calls like a hierarchy or a tree. The main function is at the very top and it calls out to subfunctions, which in turn call out to their own subfunctions. And because of the way code executes in order from top to bottom, a node in this function tree will never deallocate until all of its children have been deallocated. And as a result, it's a perfect fit for a linear allocator, or some people more directly call it in this case, a stack allocator. Just as a final tiny note, the more experienced programmers in the audience might have heard me say that code always executes from top to bottom and thought, 
Well, what about asynchronous functions? Well, you're totally right. As a result, asynchronous functions require a more complex allocation strategy for managing their data, and that's just one of the reasons why async support in programming languages is so complex to implement. Allocators can sound kind of intimidating on the surface, but as we've seen, all an allocator really does is take memory that's been allocated to it, subdivide it further, and then hand it out to other things. It's actually very simple. And if you want to see an example of an allocator that's not just at the operating system or the programming language level, I have another video about memory arenas, which are a special type of allocator that you can implement yourself.